Good morning, Tower View family. Good morning. This is Pastor Darren, and I hope you're doing well today. Uh, I am uh, switching roles this morning with Pastor Nelson. Uh, Pastor Nelson is going to be preaching the sermon this morning over Psalm 118, and uh, I will be preaching the uh, or leading the Bible study today. And I'm Darren Smith, uh, senior pastor at Tower View Baptist Church. It's good to have you with us, and I'm going to share this on our Facebook page and other places here. Um, but uh, if you have any questions about what it means to be a Christian, if you have any questions about what it means to know Christ, we'd love to talk to you more about that. Please drop a message below, a comment below, and we would uh, be glad to follow up with you as we do. Let me just share this on our, our kind of being tech person slash uh, uh, presenter here today, or teacher here today. Uh, just one second as we get this going here. Uh, we are from Kansas City, Missouri. We're at Tower View Baptist Church, uh, which is 7301 Northeast 50th Street in Kansas City. We're just by the Worlds of Fun Water Tower, uh, which isn't too far away um, from the Worlds of Fun uh, entertainment area. So hopefully all that will be opening up back soon, and uh, we'll look forward to that as well. But we are here. We're continuing our study through the book of Luke. And we are jumping around. If you are joining us, if you're if you're following along on the Explore the Bible stuff, we are going to be jumping around this week because of the the holiday coming up, um, and the holiday week that we're in. So we're actually going to be in Luke 19 today. Uh, we'll be looking at the resurrection next week. Pastor Nelson will be leading that. And then two weeks from now, we'll be back to Luke 18, which is what we should be on today. But because of the holiday, it's a little switched around. So uh, when you share it or you like it, it actually helps people uh, when they scroll on them to see it. So uh, if you would do that, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, let me just do a couple more things here and we'll be ready uh, as we do. And so, okay, actually, I think we are ready now. So got all the tech stuff up. But yes, if you want to like or share this, that'd be greatly appreciated. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Shirley and Don. Hi, Bill. It's good to see you guys. Thanks for being here. Um, it's hard. Uh, Nelson makes this look a lot easier than it is, but it's, it's, it's hard to do the tech stuff because you can't do some things until you actually start up the live feed and then do it while you're talking and click buttons. And so, uh, kudos to pastor Nelson as he does this every week. Again, my name is Darren Smith. I'll be leading Bible study today. Nelson is preaching for me this week as we just ended a major book study, and uh, we'll be back to, to normal next week as we do. So let's pray. We're going to start reading Luke 19, verses 28 through, uh, I believe it's 47 or 48, and then uh, we will get into our text. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to, to be here, to study together. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to just uh, to have your word, Lord, uh, in a day and an age where everything is always changing. We are always reminded and need to be reminded of the fact, first off, Lord, that you do not change. Uh, you tell us in Malachi 3, 6, if, if you change, Lord, we would be consumed. And Lord, you tell us in Hebrews 13, 8, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And for that, we are ever grateful. And you, you tell us in Matthew 28, that lo, you're with us always, even till the end of the age. So Lord, thank you. And Father, we thank you that your word is, is unchanging too. Proverbs 30 affirms that. 2 Timothy 3 affirms that. That Lord, in, in this world of pundits and political talk and press releases and all the things that go on, uh, Father, we are thankful that your word has not changed. Through all the changes of human history, your word, your gift to us, <clears throat> has remained the same. Thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, we just pray this morning, open our eyes and, and ears, spiritually speaking, to see your word. May your spirit illumine our hearts. For those without Christ who may be watching this live or later on, and even sometime down the road, that they would clearly hear the gospel through this as well. Thank you, Lord. We celebrate the, the, the resurrection of your son every week. Every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. But for this cultural moment in our time, Lord, where this week, where we we call it the Holy Week, Lord, where people will be perhaps more in tune to what is going on, Lord, that you would save someone. Save our family, save our friends, save those around us, Lord, we pray. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> excuse me. Well, Luke 18, uh, excuse me, Luke 19, starting in verse 28, is where we're going to be this If you want to pull that up, that would be great. Luke 19, verses 28 and following. I'm going to read out the ESV version, uh, which is our Pew Bible for sake of 
uh, continuity there as we do. And so let's read. This is God's word. Let's hear it this morning. And this is what it says. And when he, when Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, verse 30, Go into the village in front of you where you are entering, and you will find a colt or a donkey tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. And so these were sent and went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, verse 35, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus upon it. And as he rode along, they spread their coats on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down from mm. the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works where they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And verse 39, And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden for, from your eyes. Verse 43, For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and harm you on every side and tear down to the ground you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Verse Luke 19, 45, And he, Jesus, entered the temple and began to drive those out who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple, and the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. Guys, that is the word of God that, is, again, is not just some political talking head that is not uh, just commentary. That is the very word of God recorded in Jesus's last days. Luke 19, 28 through the end of chapter verse 48. All right. Well, let me check one quick setting here before we get started. I want to make sure I'm not on Wi-Fi because that might actually cut me out. But in this episode, as I'm clicking around here trying to get all this stuff ready, as, as we go through, I want you just to know, you've heard this passage before. You know this passage well, many of you. You know that this is something that that Jesus has, uh, he's coming to the end of his days. He's coming to the end of his time. He's coming as, as the son of God. He's come into the world to save sinners. He's come into the world to bring salvation. He didn't come to uh, build an empire politically. He didn't come to build an empire, anything else. He came to save sinners. That's what he came to do. And this is the fulfillment of that. We know that if you're watching this, more than likely you've heard this story just a few times in your life, probably probably more than just a few times. And that's a good thing. This is, again, this is what it's all about. I mean, we, 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 we talk about the history of the Bible. We talk about creation. We talk about uh, you know David and some of the heroes of the faith. We talk about the mysteries of the Bible, you know. Uh, how did the Red Sea part? How did that work? And we look forward to those things, and there's a lot of fun things. But this is really it. This is what it's all about. Yes, creation matters. Yes, Moses coming out matters because it all points to this. Now, we're not to the cross yet, and Pastor Nelson will present on that next Sunday, but this is really what it culminates in. The Bible is not just a random group of stories that happen to come together to form a collective whole. It is, as it always has been, the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told because it, it never changes, yet people go back to it. You know, even historically, since they started these statistics, what is the greatest selling book of all time? It's the Bible. What is the greatest selling uh, uh, scripture of all time? It's not the Quran or the Book of Mormon. It's, it's the Bible. It always has been. Why? Because we find in these words, more than anything, we find in these words, not just hope for now but hope for all eternity. And that's what we're here to study. Let me just say some quick shout outs. Hi, Robert, Professor Abens. Hi, Mike Mabry. Hi, Marina. It's good to see you guys this morning. And so as we start this, I just want to keep that frame in mind. This is not just another story. You know that. This isn't just a wives tale. This isn't just some tall tale or, you know, the fish was this big and then it got this big. This is what it's all about. This is the gospel. 
So Jesus is coming in here at the very end of his life. And you notice there, right as he, as, as you go back up to verse 28, and we'll kind of start up there. As you start up in verse 28, it said, when he went ahead of them, he told them several instructions. And I think this is very interesting because Jesus is going to show us something here. He's going to first show us his perfect knowledge. You notice this here as he brings us about his perfect knowledge. He does this in a way. He, he He's sending ahead two of his disciples now. He's sending them ahead to get a colt or a donkey, which which you see. And as he goes through this, his disciples are, are told to find a donkey that's never been ridden upon. And we see him describing this in a way that is so key because it's so detailed. And, and, and in short, he speaks like no one. Who, who's ever spoken before. But remember, this is God. This is God in the flesh. Nothing is hidden from his sight. He speaks like one whose eyes are in every place. He knows the seen and he knows the unseen. And if you remember from the Gospels, we, we are told in one place that, that Jesus knew their thoughts. We're, we're told in, an, in John 2.25, we're told that he knew, Jesus knew what was in man. And we're told in John 6.64 that Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. Now, secular people would come and say, well, Jesus Jesus must have been a good reader of people. He must have been like that old, it's been a few years now, uh, called the mentalist, where there are some people who are just so good at reading uh, body cues and, and settings and context that they can logically piece things together about what's really going on in a situation or in a person. And, and within reason, make a good educated guess. But that's not what is going on here. Jesus, as, as he's making his way into Jerusalem in, in the Passover time, in what we would call uh, Palm Sunday, uh, he has a knowledge that is unlike anything else. It's, knowledge is particular to God. It's, it's passages like this, as we read in the opening of Luke 19, 28 through verse 35, that, that are meant to remind us that the man Christ Jesus is not only a man, He's what Romans 9, 5 says. He is God blessed forever. He is God. That's what separates him. Don't be fooled. You know, this time of year, Time Magazine or uh, U.S. News and World Reports or some of those uh, places always put out uh, an article, some new finding about Jesus that's going to discredit the Gospels or the History Channel or Discovery Channel or, or, or uh, you know, one of those type of things is going to bring out some new evidence to disprove these things. Friends, this world, Jesus told us this is how the world would be. The world is not in the majority going to believe this message. It's a foolish message that we believe that first there's a God. That's a foolish thing. Atheists say, Psalm 14 calls atheists fools because they believe there's no God, even though Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the handiwork of God. So when you believe this gospel, when you believe there's first off a God, when you believe there's second off a God who came down into this world, when you believe third off that this God became flesh and we call him Jesus and he lived a perfect, sinless, mistake-free life, you're going to be kind of weird. You're going to be weird because that's what the, 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 the Bible says is true and we believe it's true, but the world is not. But this God knows everything and he knows men will reject this information. And when he, when he sends out the disciples and they find it just as he said, you know, someone could look at this and say, you know, maybe Jesus just paid off all these people and, and uh, you know, they knew they'd be coming. You know, you know, that happens in reality TV shows, doesn't it, Pastor? Well, yeah, I suppose it can. But this place was crazy. There were millions of people coming to the Passover. Jews who, who, who were ethnic Jews, uh, uh, God-fearing Gentiles. This place was a madhouse. It was an absolute mad. If you've ever been to New York City, uh, and I've only been there a couple of times in my life on mission trips, during the week, during l rush hour or lunch hour, and you're around Times Square and just the, it's like ants on a, on, on a piece of bread that has honey on it outside in the summer. I mean, it's just nonstop. You can't stop it. So when Jesus knows all this information about where the cult's going to be, what the man's going to say, all these things, the disciples just kind of go with it. They know Jesus well enough that what he says is going to happen. And that, So friends, this is what I want to remind you of. The thought of Christ's perfect knowledge should alarm those without Jesus. And for, thus, and, and for those of us who know him, it should remind us that he is faithful. That, that the great and righteous judge is coming. And, and, and he knows all their doings. And the judge of all sees it continually. Job 34.2 says, quote, There's no darkness where the workers of sin can hide themselves. There's no darkness where anyone can hide. 
if someone without Jesus goes into a secret chamber or goes into the, you know, locally goes into Subtropolis off, off 210 Highway, just south of the church, or if, if they privately scheme terrible things, Christ knows it, he observes it, and he sees it. And if they speak uh, secretly about their neighbor, God knows it, Christ hears. And, and, and so if you're not a Christian, or if you know someone who's not a Christian, I, I want to just interject this into the, the story of Jesus going to Jerusalem because Jesus not only knew where all his stuff was going to be lined up so they could have the Passover, but he also knows the hearts of men well enough so that when that time comes, all the secret thoughts will be brought before him. And Christian, that should, that should alert us too because we are told that every loose word, everything we say, everything we do as Christians is going to be held in judgment. Every, every thought, every intention, every motivation of our heart is going to be brought bare before God. But Christian, remind yourself, you know the end of this story. Even though we will stand accountable for our lives before God in his perfect knowledge, we will be covered by the blood of Christ. We are covered by the blood of Christ. Jesus just didn't save you from 99.98% of your sins. He saved you 100% of your sins, past, present, and future. And that's an awesome thing. And so as we enter into Jerusalem, I just want to remind you of that, that his perfect knowledge here is not just something that just suddenly turned on for Jesus. It's something that's always been there, and it's something that he always has had because he is God and he is God alone. But this should also... Christian, this should also encourage you because as we come to this, this, this passage should encourage you. The master's eye, Jesus' eye is always upon you. When you're doing work for him, he knows where you live. He knows your daily struggles. He knows your trials. He knows, uh, uh, the, 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 he knows all the things you're going through, doesn't he? And there's not a word in your mouth or a thought in your heart that Jesus doesn't know altogether. And that should encourage you because you are never alone. Jesus did say, and I prayed it a minute ago, he's with you always until the end of the age. He never leaves you. Psalm 139, his presence is always with you. And, and we know from John 21, 17, it's, uh, Peter said, you, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Peter acknowledged even at the end, after the resurrection, before Jesus went back up to heaven, when he was being uh, restored to the faith, as it were, he knew that God loved him. So friends, you can always say, my master is looking at me, and I desire to live and move in the sight of Christ. You know, sometimes, uh, especially it's harder now as I have a lot of friends. We have a lot of church members working from home, my wife included right now. And, you know, it's it's tempting because there's no boss watching. There's no camera on you necessarily. Uh, it's tempting just to jump on Facebook or jump on the news or do the uh, other busy work that we need to do in our personal lives on the computer or whatever. But isn't it a good reminder that whether we're working with our hands, we're working outside, or whether we're just by ourselves all the time, that God is with us and he's always watching us. His eye never leaves the sparrow is what he said in Matthew 6. That's a great old hymn too. But friends, he's with us. And as these disciples went out into Jerusalem to do all the things that Jesus said that to, for them to do, he was watching over them. And I want to just remind you of that. He was watching over them as they came. Good morning, Rose. Good morning, Jackie. I see you guys there. It's good to have you with us. So that's the first thing I want you to see. Second thing about Luke, we're in Luke 19 for joining us. Luke 19, we're just kind of rolling through verses 28 uh, through 48, the end of the chapter. Um, is I want you to see how public this last entry was for Jesus. We are told of him riding on a donkey or a colt. He's like a king visiting a country or a conqueror returning in triumph to his native land. And, and we read in, in Luke 19 that there were a multitude, and I'm going to make sure I get this word right. I have the King James and the uh, ESV in front of me, but it says there were a multitude of those who came to see him. A multitude. How many? Well, we don't know for sure, but verse 37 says, as he was drawing near, the whole multitude. There's a lot of people here. And so we read that as he rode into the city, there's just this loud, ruckus praise. And, and, and you have to think, it's like, you know, it's if you've ever been, I'm not a big golf fan, but Tiger Woods, I, I'm of the age where when Tiger Woods was coming, uh, crazy to think, almost 30 years ago now, that he, when, 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 when they play 
golf, and if, if I'm you're a golfer, you can correct me later. But when they play golf on the PGA Tour, the the professional tour, you know there'll often be they have to be really quiet, kind of like uh, they're they're hunting wabbits, whatever that guy was on Looney Tunes. You got to be really really quiet. But then all of a sudden in a golf course, you'll hear this raw like like just out of the blue this erupting cheer that comes out. Well, that's kind of like it was. You know, the the Passover is busy. It's there are people buying things and selling things and the Romans are trying to keep peace and people are just trying to find their way through. Families are trying to stick together. Moms are holding on to sons and daughters and dads are trying to leave, you know. It's just it's a crazy house right now in Jerusalem back 2000 years ago. And all of a sudden, as as all this is going on, the multitudes come to the entrance. And and like a golf scene when someone makes a great shot and, and all the golf course, even if it's quiet, can hear it, there's this, there's this erupting of praise. And so why are they praising? Well, they're praising because they see Jesus, who's the people's hero, coming in riding on a colt. And this is this is unusual because this is not what Jesus has done. He's walked everywhere. Jesus had, you know, Jesus had a Fitbit or a sports watch. Who knows how many steps a day he had? He probably had way more than 10,000. But as they came in, as they continued to come in, Jesus was coming to a place that had mixed emotions. And you know this. Some wanted him to be king. They wanted to enthrone him as king in John 6. And if they were a Baptist group, they probably would have already had the building committee. They probably would have already had the personnel committee lined up, ready to ready to hire him on the spot. But Jesus isn't coming to be king politically. He's not coming to be king, uh, you know, societally. He's coming to be the savior of the world. Yet as he does it, he does it in a way that is strikingly unlike any other time. He's riding in on a colt, the donkey, showing his authority, showing his majesty, showing these things. And that was his doing. They didn't force him on there. We just read in Luke 28, uh, 19, 28 through 35, that they put him on there. He set it up that way. You know, but we often see Jesus withdrawing um, to the wilderness. We see him going into uh, the high mountains when they're in, on the, the lakes. We see him telling people to tell no one. But right now, in this moment, as he enters Jerusalem, all that has changed. Uh, reserve is thrown to the side. He seems to court now public notice. He appears uh, desirous that all should see him and should mark and note and observe all that he did. And the reasons for this appear, may appear hard to discover. But when you think about it for just a second, they, are re they really are easy to understand. He knew now that the time had come for him to die for sinners. His work as the great prophet. Remember, Jesus, uh, uh, John Calvin kind of put this together for us in the Reformation time. Jesus is prophet, he's priest, and he's king, the three offices of Christ. But uh, he, his work as prophet was concerned, was almost finished and complete. And so his work as a sacrifice for sin and the substitute for sinners, though, remained to be accomplished. And so before giving himself up as sacrifice, he desired to draw the attention of the whole Jewish nation to himself. Galatians 3.1 tells us that Jesus was publicly crucified, crucified in our sight, and the Lamb of God was about to be killed. The great sin offering was about to, to happen, and it fit that the eyes of all Israel should be upon him. Now, Jesus knows. Remember, we just talked about how Jesus knows everyone and everything. Jesus knows that that that, that the inside man, they're going to reject him. Christian friend, don't forget that we are not born with a clean slate. We're not born with, with you know, a blank slate, whatever you used to call it. You're not born half good and half bad. You're not born good. You are born, every one of us is born, no matter how cute and cuddly you are as a baby, you are born as a sinner. Psalm 51, David says, in iniquity, my mother conceived me. We are born into sin. We inherit Adam's sin. And so Jesus knows as he's drawing all the public attention now, as he rides into Jerusalem, he knows these people are going to, woo, Jesus, woo, 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 go, Jesus, go. But in a few few days, uh, you know, a few hours even, the whole tenor is going to change. And so the wisdom of God ordered these events, whatever man may have thought of Christ of toning death, whatever they thought about it, they can never deny the fact that Jesus died. They may question whether it, it, it covers their sin, Jesus's death. They may question how it went down, but they publicly, he rode in Jerusalem a few days before. This was not in secret. You know, it's interesting. You look at all the world religions. You know, Muhammad went to a cave by himself to get the Quran. 
You look at uh, uh, the the Persian. Uh, uh, I just lost his name. Zoroaster. Zoroaster. Back in the BC area, got all his stuff in private. Joseph Smith hid behind a kind of like a, a partition almost, and uh, just about uh, five miles from here is the is the, the the monument to the 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 Mormons have to the Book of Mormon, and and Joseph uh, Joseph Smith supposedly wrote out all these things, but only he could understand it. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't go away in secret and die for the sins of the world. He comes away publicly. Publicly, he was brought before the high priest. Publicly, he was betrayed. Publicly, he was condemned. Publicly, he was led forth. And publicly, he was nailed to a cross. And so let us leave this whole passage with, with, with just thankfulness that Jesus came into Jerusalem, that he was crucified, that he bore the wrath of the Father. And, and nothing can compare to that joy. And so that's what I want you to know. God often works in secret. You know that. God often answers your prayer in, in secret. But when Jesus died on the cross, even people rejected it. Even in their sin, you know, born into sin, they rejected it. He still died publicly, and that cannot be taken away. There's so much pushback whether Jesus actually existed. There's a whole uh, seminar of people called the Jesus Seminar. They're more geriatric these days than they are engaging because they're really, really old. Uh, the, Dr. Spong, Dr. Shelby Spong, and some others. Anyway, you can go on and on. But there's a lot of people out there that question whether Jesus was historical. Friends, nobody questions whether Jesus lived, usually, if they're in the right mind. Just like there are people who question the Holocaust, just as a side note. You ask any survivor of that, and you ask them if that really happened, and I think you'll get an answer pretty straightforwardly. I mean, duh, it makes no sense. But when Jesus went into Jerusalem, he died publicly. He didn't die in a closet. He didn't die in a world far away. He didn't do this. He did it publicly because he wanted to show once and for all again that God in the flesh had come down and he so loved the world that he gave his life for us. And that's why Christians too, we are to be publicly out sharing the gospel. That's why he didn't send, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, it's often said, well, if God wants to save people, why doesn't he just just click a button or do what he does. You know, he can create the world in an instant. Why did he just save everyone he wants to save and, and, and let us go? Well, he sent us out publicly too. We are to publicly, privately, wherever we are, as we go about our way, to go and share the gospel. And if you're not a Christian, the gospel is that you, you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, and that he gave his life for you. The only way to heaven is through Jesus. That's what we know. And so that's what I want you to see in that passage. Jonathan, it's good to see you this morning. I'm just looking at the chat here for just a second. Guys, and so as we, you just need to know that. You need to know that these things that are happening, these things that are going on are, are all within God's plan. Let's go down to verse 41, and I'll read it again. It says, and when he was, came near, saying, he, he, he looked over the city and wept over it, Luke 19, 41, saying, would that even you had known on this day the things that make for peace? saying, uh, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Verse 43, for the days will come upon you and your enemies will set a barricade around you and surround you and tear down you and hem you in on every side and, and tear you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave you one stone upon another. Verse 44, Luke 19, because you did not know the day of their visitation. So we learn first of, 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 of what's happening here in, in Luke 41, 19, 41 through 48. Well, this is our last section. Is we are told that when he came to Jerusalem, Jesus wept over it. Now, now take, take a moment for a second. Let's take a time out and, and remember when else Jesus wept. Jesus wept, at least as far as we know. The only two times we have are in John 11, when Jesus wept, of course. And everyone loves this verse because it's the short, one of the shortest verses in the Bible. Jesus wept. Uh, in John 11, Jesus wept at his friend Lazarus. Jesus wept because Lazarus died. Now, being God, of course, Jesus is well aware that death is in the world, but in his humanity. Remember, Jesus is fully God. He's fully man. We call that the hypostatic union in, in big theological terms. It's a mystery, but, but uh, his humanity doesn't override his deity, uh, being God, his being God, his deity doesn't override his humanity. Together they are simultaneous, yet at the same time, Jesus felt pain. Jesus felt emotion. I mean, we don't see it in scriptures, but there, I'm sure Jesus laughed with his disciples. I'm sure he, Jesus, uh, you know, in, in a holy way, uh, played jokes occasionally. I mean, he's human after all. He, Not to be crass, but he went to the bathroom, he ate, he drank, he, he did all the human things we do. He felt pain. 
you know, Jesus did these things. And so when we get to Luke 19, 41, it says Jesus wept over Jerusalem. We are told he wept over it. And that, that word in the Greek is, is very similar to John 11, where we're told he wept over um, he wept over uh, uh, Lazarus' death. It's, it's, it's a convulsing weeping. It's, it's just a, it's, it's a tear-draining, emotional roller coaster uh, of just uh, flooding out that, how sad you are. And how hurt you are. And so, but but you got to think about this. Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. Why? Because he knew the character of the people of Jerusalem. They're cheering for him now. Woo! Go Jesus! But their, their cruelty, their self-righteousness, their stubbornness, their, their prejudice against him, their sin, their, 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 their denying of God, their pride of their heart, they were not hidden from him. He well knew that they were going to, within a very few days, give him an unjust judgment. Give him... A, a very delivery to the Romans. They, he knew that they would hand him over to suffer and to be crucified. And, and yet they were distinctly in his mind's eye. And yet knowing all this, he still beheld the city. Luke 19, 41, and, 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 uh, and he wept over it. And, and so friends, we need to realize that we are in great error if we suppose that Jesus cares for none except his own people. He cares for all people. His heart is wide enough to take interest in all mankind. You know, isn't that what the scripture tells us? The rain falls on the just and the unjust. He has a love of general pity, if you will, for every man, woman, and child on this earth. Red, yellow, black, and white, to use the old song. His voice, and he has a general compassion. We call this, uh, uh, we call this gen- uh, providence. We call this uh, uh, common grace. But, but God, God has taken care of the world. And so he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, let, let's be clear here. J- Jesus does have a special love for his sheep, for those who truly know him, who've been brought by faith. Those in a wider scope of scripture, he's called to know him. Uh, Ephesians 1, Romans 9, you know, throughout the whole Bible, John 6, he, he, he's going to draw those who are his to himself. But as he does that, they will never be able to say on Judgment Day that Christ was not merciful and that he was not ready to save. Jesus is willing to save you if you will come to him. Today is the day of salvation. And and we really know little of Christianity if we don't feel a deep concern as Jesus did here for unconverted people. I mean, think about this. He cared for people even when he was dying on a cross. He's reaching out. He's, he, he's answering the thief on the cross. He's reaching out to his mother and telling John to take care of her. But so often we have a lazy indifference as Christians about the spiritual state of others. Uh, and it may doubtless save us much trouble because we really have no concern sometimes whether our neighbors go to heaven whether they go to hell or, or, or whatever they do. Because we live, especially most of you watching us, we live in America. We live in an individualistic country. I do my thing. You do your thing. This is my space. You stay in your space, and we'll, we'll be good. We'll be peach keen. But that's not what happened. And this is what David prayed. Uh, he, he, David prayed in, in Romans 9.2. He said, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow for the heart, uh, sorrow of heart for my people, my, or my brothers in Israel. That's Romans 9.2. And above all, we, he, Jesus Uh, Jesus felt this overwhelming need to love people. You say, well, he's God. But if we prayed that same thing, we ask God, Lord, help me. Help me to have a broken heart for people who don't know you. Lord, help me to have a broken heart, not just in Christmas time, not just at Easter time, but all the time for people who do not know Jesus. This is why at our church at Tower View, especially for you Tower View members, we really push you to, we really want to push you. Sometimes physically, not physically, but you know what I mean. We really want to get you to the point where you see the need to keep sharing the gospel. How do we reach people when we can't have big mass events? And that may be changing as vaccines and COVID, you know, hopefully simmers down in the coming months and years. But as things go forward, how are we going to win people to Jesus? It's going to start by praying that we have a heart like Jesus did for Jerusalem as he entered it, that we're broken over it. And secondly, it's going to start by us individually. And as a church, yes, but individually, where we live, where we hang out, where we go, where we have business, taking the time to share the gospel with people. You know, every Tuesday, and and Linda Davis is on here. I see you, Linda, over there. Hi, Sandy and Linda. I see your comments. Miss Linda, I hope she didn't mind sharing this, but we're very encouraged every Tuesday 
Uh, most Tuesdays, Miss Linda is on Messenger messaging me, and I share this with our guys and gals who go out with us. Every Tuesday, we go knock on doors around our neighborhood. Miss Linda is saying, you know, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking of you. It's Tuesday, and that's just that, that thing. And we appreciate that. Thank you, Linda, for your constant prayers for people in our neighborhood and all those who are doing it. I know it's not just Linda, but, but, but a lot of people knock on doors and go out. But I'm as guilty as any. My neighbors who, our house on this side, our house on that side, I'm at our house right now. Our house is across the street. I can see out the window uh, where you, behind the camera here. They need Jesus too. And I'm as guilty as any of forgetting that. It's easier to go out to people you don't know because you, they don't see you live in your life. And, and your family, you know, sometimes family is the hardest people to share with. But Jesus didn't care what context he was in. Wherever he went, he prayed, Lord, Lord, these, you love these people. I, I want to show the love of Christ to them. So, friend, wherever we are, may we have the heart of Christ to do just that. Second thing we learn from these last verses in Luke 19, 41 through 43, is just that there is always going to be a willful ignorance. Uh, there's, there's, the, there's a willful ignorance of that which is sinful and blameworthy. Look, Jesus re denounced judgments on Jerusalem because they did not know the time of their visitation. Jerusalem might have known the times of the Messiah. They might have known the times of, uh, of, of these things. But, but all the rulers of Jerusalem were ignorant of these things. They would not calmly examine the evidence. I mean, do you remember Herod when the wise men came to him? He, he, he acted like he wanted to know, but he really wanted to just see whether there was another king. And so the principle laid down here is very important. And, and, and what Jesus is getting at in these verses as he talks to the Pharisees, it teaches us, that ignorance is not excusable. That where, when men might know the truth or when someone knows the truth about Jesus but refuse to believe it or refuse to know it, their guilt is very great in God's sight. There's a degree of knowledge for which we're all responsible. Just as God takes care of everyone, he's also left us another theological, he's left us general revelation. He's given us, uh, again, you look at Romans 1, it tells that you can look at all creation and know that there's a God. Now you can deny him, but you can know there's a God. So friends, let us just impress on our hearts the, the need for us to know. If we know the truth, Lord, help me live the truth. I mean, let us not flatter ourselves with, with the fact that we know all the Bible. You know, most of us, we're honest, we know more truth than we live out. We know more scripture than we care to, 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 to just, just believe and go do. And it's not necessarily bad to have another Bible study. You're here, and we're so grateful you're here. But often it's just a prayer, Lord, help me not to be like these Pharisees. They knew the scriptures, but they refused to believe it. They refused to believe the word literally in front of them. And so... You know, it's it's going to come a judgment day someday. And on that day, there will be no excuses. There will be no making deals with God. There's only, did I believe who Jesus was or did I not? And these Pharisees, these Pharisees just refused to believe the very truth that came to them. So just another thing here is, uh, as, we, as we look to close these verses, is that God sometimes is pleased to give people uh, special opportunities and invitations. I want you to see this, and, and this is a special note I looked into this week. Uh, but if you look at verse 44, it says, And they will not, Jesus speaking, they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of their, or the time of your visitation. Look, the Son of God visited Jerusalem, and the mightiest miracles that man had ever seen, that, that people had ever noticed, were, were done in their midst, were done right in front of their eyes. And the most wonderful preaching, the ears, I mean, Spurgeon, Whitfield, Calvin, the apostles, I don't know, I'm just listing people off, Billy Grahams and whoever's the modern person, uh, couldn't hold a, a candlestick out to what was preached within Jerusalem's walls. And the days of the Lord's ministries were the, were the days of the clearest calls to repentance and faith. And they were marked by uh, peculiar, special, and, and, and were unlike any other calls of the prophets before. Yet it seemed impossible that they were disregarded. But they were disregarded. And the Lord declared that all those who disregarded these special visits that God gave them through Christ would be held to a, a, a great judgment. And friends, this is a deep and mysterious thing. It, and it requires stating and handling it very well. But there seems no doubt that churches... And nations and even individuals sometimes are visited with special times of God's blessings. And that their neglect of those will, will bring spiritual ruin. You know, I think back, I mentioned Billy Graham a second ago, and I don't agree with Billy Graham on everything. We agree on the essentials. In his later years, he kind of spread his wings out a little bit further than perhaps most of us would like theologically. 
But at the end of the day, Billy Graham preached the truth. He preached the gospel. There were, there, were, there were countless millions, hundreds of millions, probably via media and TV that heard his gospel. He was able, in those times, God raised him up at a special time after World War II when the world was in mass chaos and we could still travel uh, frequently and in places. He was able to preach in countries and locations where missionaries couldn't get in if they tried to. And God brought up special revelation to those. And there were movements of people who came to Christ, but the majority of people didn't budge an inch. Majority of the people heard the message. They, they, they thought it was great, this great spectacle, this great preacher, this, this world-known figure as Billy Graham was at the time. But it didn't move them. Facts plain in history, in history and biography appear to prove that this is so. There are times, like Jesus mentions here in Luke 19.45, as he enters Jerusalem, that God brings up special places, special preachers, special times of revival even, where, where they are shown forth, but people still don't believe. The last day will probably show the world that there were seasons of lives, who many who died in sin, when God did what Paul said in Acts 17. You remember that, that, that sermon he gave to the Areopagus on Mars Hill? He said, God is not far from each one of us. And I think the last day will show that there were many people that God drew very near to when their conscience was particularly alive. When God, when God showed them their sin, they were like that rich young ruler who was very interested in the things of Christ. But when it came time to seal the deal, to repent and turn to their sins, they were, they were 18 inches away, as it said, between them and heaven. And there were days that I think coming, that on Judgment Day, as we stand with Christ and judging the world, those of us who are believers, that the neglect of such seasons as Jesus gave them here at the end of his ministry. And so, friends, it is a special prayer. It is a reminder to us that God will bring revival to lands, but not everyone's going to believe. Actually, the majority won't. And so, Christian, there is the, there's always that question, you know, Pastor, in heaven, will it be, will there be more people in heaven than hell or more people in hell than heaven? Look, we really don't know. Revelation tells us that there will be a countless multitude praising Christ at the end of the age. Uh, we see that as, as, uh, as the, the souls are under the throne of God in Revelation 6 through 8 and all those things, we, there's a number that John could not count. So we know God isn't just saving a chosen frozen, as they say, but at the same time, the majority of people, it seems in Scripture, are going to reject the gospel, just as we saw in Jesus' last days. The Pharisees, uh, the common Jewish people, the, the Romans, they all did. But yet God still saved people. Is God just even, if, even if, if, if it's true that most people reject him? Yes, he is. Because God has given first general revelation. You can look around and see there's a God. And second, he's also given specific revelation in his son. Hebrews 1 tells us that God once spoke through prophets and all these things, but now he has spoken to us finally through his son, Hebrews chapter 1. And so he knew that the temple and its services would soon be destroyed. He knew the veil would be torn. He knew that, uh, that, that God, uh, that all these things would happen. He knew all the pomp and circumstance of religious life in Jerusalem would come to a halt. That happened in about 70 AD when Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans and the temple was destroyed. Once again, has not been rebuilt since. It happened about 30, eh, 35, 40 years after Jesus came, roughly speaking. So what's my point? My point is, is that Jesus truly is reminding these people that it is I, you're either for me or you're against me. There is no middle ground. You cannot be a cat walking on a picket fence between two bulldogs on both sides. You can't play Switzerland with your faith. You can't, you can't be in a, uh, you can't be like most of people my age and younger generation. I don't know what we're on now. Z, is that right? Generation Y and Z, whatever the young people are. Uh, teenagers, even the young kids are today. You can't be a nun, N-O-N-E. You can't be a nun religion. That's very popular these days. Well, I'm just nothing. Well, God says you have to make a choice. And if you're a Christian, and if God has opened your eyes to know the truth of the gospel, you just need to rejoice in that. You need to thank God for that. And you need to say, Lord, thank you for saving me. That's the truth you own. But if you're not a Christian, 
you need to make that choice. Do you know Jesus? Have you come to know Jesus? Or have you, ha, do you have questions about him? Let us know. But if you're a Christian, I think most of us watching today are, based upon the comments I see and people I know who usually watch this, just thank God that you're saved. Not because you were better than anybody, smarter or wiser, or that you figured out the mystery. But thank God that someone shared the gospel with you. Maybe it was on TV. Maybe it was your pastor or preacher or Sunday school teacher, vacation Bible school. Maybe it was a gospel track. I don't know. But praise God that Jesus came. He didn't die on an island far away. He died publicly. And he's calling you to go public with your faith as well. Guys, let's pray together. We uh, thank you. Uh, it went a little longer than Pastor Nelson usually does. That's all right. Uh, you'll live. I'll live. But uh, so grateful you're here this morning. Pray for Pastor Nelson. Uh, why do we, you know, I often get asked, well, well, if you're the pastor and we pay you to be the pastor, why are you taking a break? Well, it's good for other people, and Pastor Nelson is on staff too, by the way, to hear the gospel preach. He's preaching the very things the people said. Nelson is preaching, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. He's preaching Psalm 118, the triumphal entry. And if you're able to join us in person at 1030 a.m. Uh, at our church or online about 1050-ish, uh, on our Facebook or our webpage, please do. You'll be blessed. Pastor Nelson has really prepared for this. It's a very straightforward passage, but it has such implications for our faith. Let's pray together, guys, and uh, we're going to go out from there. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this passage from Luke. We thank you, Lord, that you know all things, Lord. You, you, you search our hearts and you know our minds. That, Lord, you're able to take us and, and use us, Father, for your glory. But, Lord, I do pray you remind us of our, our, our mission. It's not just to go to church on Sunday. That's great. It's not just to grow in Christ. That's wonderful. But, Father, mixed in all that uh, is to know you and to share you with others. So, Lord, we pray for our families, our neighbors, grandkids, kids, our coworkers, uh, those that we've never met before, we will meet someday, that, Lord, you would help us to verbally share that gospel with them. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We do pray for Pastor Nelson as he's preaching this morning. Draw people to that message, Lord. Let the gospel be clear, and I know it will be through our brother. Pray also for uh, Tom Woods tonight, our, our one of our young seminary guys, who's going to be preaching our seminary Sunday at 4 o'clock this evening, Lord. We're excited to hear from him, too, preaching on similar topics this, this evening. But Father, we pray all this week that we don't just get in a holy feeling because it's quote-unquote holy week on the calendar. But Lord, every day of the year that we are reminded of what your son has done for us, that he died for us, he loves us, and he's always watching over us. And we are on the side of history that has won, not by anything but your grace, Lord, through your son, by faith alone in Christ alone. Thank you so much. Pray all this today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, that is it today. That's all I got. Uh, we're going to uh, get uh, our son packed up here and head over to church and get ready uh, to help out over there. If you're watching this and you're new to us, again, my name is Darren Smith, Senior Pastor at Tower View Baptist Church. It's good to have you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Linda, it's good to have you. Sa Sandy, again, thank you so much. And uh, all the others who are there, guys, thank you as you come. And uh, just if, if you have any questions about our church or if you have any questions about uh, what it means to know Jesus, let us know. We are not a fancy pants church. We are just regular Joe people uh, that put on our pants one leg at a time. But we have a special thing going right now. God is really doing some special things in our people. We've got some building projects going on. That's great. We've got offerings that are out, out of the roof. That's wonderful. Thank you for your faithfulness. But ultimately, it's God growing people and hearing the message of the gospel. That is the awesome thing. And so God is growing spiritual fruit in our midst. And so if you're looking for a church to engage with, be a part of, even in COVID, we'd love to connect with you. There's there's so many solid churches. We, we're going to be praying for some later on too. It's not a competition, but if we can help serve you, if we can help be a church home for you, we'd like to do that with you to God's glory. So guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Judy Hunt Sucker. It's good to see you. Professor we call him Professor Robert Evans, our local carpentry master carpenter. I'm going to call him out in a good way. Thank you, brother. It's good to have you. We'll see you guys later. I'm going to sign off here. We're going to head over to church. And uh, we love you guys. Take care. Mike, it's good to see you too. We'll see you. Bye-bye.